microphone check. One, two, the microphone check. One, two, one, two, the microphone check. I got my headphones tuned between two different AM stations and my briefcase is full of declassified information. Declassified, uh huh, mm -hmm. declassified. Good evening and welcome to news from Neptune for the 29th week of 2011. For more than 20 years, this program has been a spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion of the news of the week and its coverage by the media. First on local radio station WEFT, and when I was censored and excluded there, welcomed, I'm happy to say, by the good people at Urbana Public Television, which does in fact seem to be, quote, an accessible, responsible, and responsive media outlet, which WEFT by its charter is supposed to be, and I'm sorry to say, is not. I'm Carl Estabrook. My discussants tonight are David Green and Ron Zoke. Our format will be to take turns introducing a topic or a, a subject, a uh, comment, uh, an outrage from the week's news, uh, which the others will comment on or raise questions about. We'll try to go around the table several times. Our program's name, News from Neptune, was chosen to honor Noam Chomsky who's been talking since about American politics for more than twice as long as we've been on the air. Chomsky has said that in the American media, quote, either you repeat the same conventional doctrines everybody is saying, or else you say something true, and it will sound like it's from Neptune. Today is Friday, July 22nd, 2011, the anniversary of the Srebrenica massacre in 1995. Uh, it is also known, uh, controversially, as the Srebrenica Genocide. Uh, it refers to the killing in July of 1995 during the Bosnian War of an uh, undetermined number, but a good number, of Bosniaks, that is Bosnian, Mu Bosnian Muslims, mainly men and boys, in and around the town of Srebrenica by units of the Army of the Republic of Srpska. The, uh, under the command of General Ratko Mladic, who is uh, on trial in The Hague for the crime right now. Uh, there has been much debate about the Srebrenica massacre and a sort of subsidiary debate that concerns our mentor Noam Chomsky when The Guardian newspaper a couple of years ago tried to present Chomsky as a denier of the Srebrenica massacre in order to destroy his uh, leftist credentials, I suppose, or his liberal credentials. Uh, the Guardian has um, a, uh, a jihad, uh, intellectual jihad, against Chomsky uh, that's had several recent examples, quite, quite amazing. Uh, it um, uh, is similar, perhaps, to Le Monde, which does something of the same thing. Uh, in both cases, they carry out a famous cartoon from uh, uh, American political discussion during the Bush years uh, that pictured American liberals caught between two fell forces, uh, two cruel alternatives. On the one hand, uh, Vice President Cheney, and on the other hand, Noam Chomsky, both of whom were presented as fanged monsters about to devour poor American liberals caught in the middle there. Well, uh, The Guardian at least believes that, and uh, apparently some other liberals do too, because Chomsky is often predicted, depicted uh, in this fashion. We'll have more to say about that before the hour is out, I hope. Uh, you're watching, as a matter of fact, news from Neptune, the Obama Fraud Sub-2 edition. And I will take time a little later and explain what I mean by that and uh, see whether my colleagues agree with me, because I'm not entirely sure they will. But we will go around in our usual fashion, uh, start with uh, Ron Zoke on topics of the week. Up to yes. you, Ron. Thank you. I will uh, begin with some remarks on uh, foreign affairs and maybe go on if there's time to talk about some domestic things and maybe even some personal things if there is still time. Uh, I like uh, Mae West. She said, said she liked two kinds of men, foreign and domestic. <laughs> and, uh, uh, first, I think it's very significant, the uh, news about the Pakistan aid uh, uh, subtraction cut off, not, not completely cut off, but uh, uh, almost uh, a third of the aid, which wound up primarily with the uh, military going to uh, Pakistan. Uh, um, 
the move that says uh, not only angered uh, the military and the political class in Pakistan, but it also, this says, stoked anger among ordinary Pakistanis. Our country, quoting, our country threw the whole country into the inferno of war and terror and made poverty our destiny, but it could not appease the Americans, said Mohammed Naman, a 41-year-old information technology specialist in the southern port of Karachi. My met, many Pakistanis have never forgiven the U.S. for slapping sanctions on the country in 1990 because of its work to develop a nuclear weapon. The decision came only a year after Pakistan and the U.S. were successful in a decade-long quest to drive the Soviets out of Afghanistan. So a former ambassador already said, I think it, said, I think it hurts Washington more than it hurts Islamabad. Assistance is influence, and when you withhold or suspend it, you deprive yourself of influence. This suspension of aid, a partial suspension, uh, was followed a day later by another a drone strike in uh, Pakistan, uh, killing 12 uh, alleged militants. This is a term of art, of course, alleged militants or suspected militants. Or uh, we don't know what they are. Yeah, how do you know uh, they're militants? They're yeah, dead after right, a strike. Yeah. Right, right. But uh, they quickly get relabeled that after we uh, uh, engage in uh, mass killing of those people. So uh, the day after the Obama administration announced it was spending $800 million in military aid, they were hit by this uh, drone attack. This uh, goes on to say Pakistan's reluctance to target Afghan militants based on, in North Waziristan, who staged cr cross-border attacks against NATO troops in Afghanistan has been one of the main sources of tension with the U.S. The U.S. refuses to publicly acknowledge the covert CIA drone program in Pakistan, as if there's uh, people who don't know about this. Pakistan is widely believed to have supported the strikes in the past, even though officials often criticize them publicly as a violation of the country's sovereignty. So this is heard again and again. I remember the Cold War days when it was uh, often said in uh, some of the more advanced anti-communist publications that uh, despite these uh, statements by Soviet uh, if it, uh, officials, uh, they were often saying privately uh, just the opposite. So whatever they said should not be taken seriously. Uh, finally, on the uh, Middle Eastern part, or the AFPAC part, uh, Clinton urges India to expand yes. influence. This uh, AP dispatch from Chennai, India mm -hmm. says, Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton on Wednesday challenged India to expand its traditional sphere of interest from South Asia to neighboring regions where it can help the United States blunt China's increasing assertiveness. Clinton appealed to India to project its influence eastward toward China's backyard in Southeast Asia and the Pacific Rim, as well as boost engagement in Central Asia on China's western flank. So we're uh, making nice with India now. We're cozying up to them after it looks as if uh, Pakistan is a hopeless case after we've <laughs> driven it into the arms of uh, China and we're getting uh, a number of declarations of uh, undying uh, brotherhood and affection between uh, Afghanistan and, uh, 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 I'm sorry, Pakistan and China. Clinton, this says, was carefully not to specifically identify China as the target of the effort to court India as an Asia-Pacific power, but her comments left little doubt about U.S. intentions. So uh, I think this is profoundly uh, significant, uh, this kind of polarization uh, going on, uh, reminding me of the three major powers who were constantly in, con in contention, two against one, an ever-shifting scene in uh, uh, 1984. So uh, I'll stop there. Uh -huh. It's amazing how Orwell keeps turning up yeah, these right, days. Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Ron. Uh, David comments on the subcontinent, Pakistan and India, and uh, what, 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 what we're doing moiling about there these days? I guess I was just, I was thinking about being about maybe 12 years old or 14 years old sometime in the early 1960s and hearing about a war between India and China mm -hmm. that went on at that time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and having and and having a friend in junior high school or something ask me, 
whose side are we are we are we on? <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. as a way of saying, you know, in the context of the Cold War, who are the good guys who and who are, yeah. who are who are who are the bad guys? I'm not sure why it wouldn't have been clear at that time, in the midst of the Cold War, but then again, I'm not sure if it was even clear then what are what you know as as it's become uh, much less clear since then what are what are in actual in inter interests are in that in that region yes you could uh, ron started uh, this evening's uh, discussion by quoting may west uh, uh, you could have quoted to your uh, uh, 12 year old friend uh, mm -hmm. if he'd recognize the name uh, mm -hmm. uh, who asked who are the good guys in that war uh, goodness had nothing to do with it All right. <laughs> All right. very good yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I don't know if I can come up with any more May, May uh, West qu uh, quotes to well, to square off the circle here. It but turns uh, out to, she turns out to be, you know, remarkably insightful and good for all occasions. Oh, yeah. She was told well. once that the ten men were waiting for her back in her uh, dressing room after her performance, and she said, "I'm tired. Send one of them home." To. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> to get back to Pakistan. <laughs> right. yeah. um, uh, the um, uh, interesting sidelight to the point you raise, uh, Ron, is the actions of Mrs. Clinton. Yes. Um, there, there, there are peculiar things emerging in the Obama administration uh, that suggest that uh, maybe Mrs. Clinton hasn't entirely given up her idea of uh, succeeding Obama as president, uh, particularly if he crashes and burns in a first term, or even even after a second term such a, should such a thing eventuate. Uh, it's been suggested, for example, that she was the driving force in the attack on Libya uh, and that Obama was so-so about it and that she pressed very hard on it. Now, uh, well, how independent is the action uh, that you were describing in uh, mobilizing India uh, to the Pakistan war? Uh, certainly, the Obama administration has vigorously pressed the Pakistan war and it may not finally make much difference which element or which uh, individuals with the administration are doing it. Uh, someone wrote very well last week that there is a very thin line between uh, the U.S. war in Pakistan and a U.S. war against Pakistan. And that wa line is being uh, progressively erased. And uh, Mrs. Clinton may be one of the uh, razors, so to speak. Well, there's a quite a history of conflict and hostility between India and of uh, Pakistan, of course, going back to 1948. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've engaged in minor shooting wars from time to time. In larger terms here, this is a, a larger meaning even beyond America's concern with the Middle East. Um, the uh, general foreign policy problem of what's called the BRICS, uh, that is the emerging economies in Brazil, Russia, India, and China. I know their problem is calling Russia an emerging economy, but hey. Uh, the BRICS are, are, a very, are a very real concern for American policymakers, and the India-China relationship and the relationship of the both of them to Pakistan, I think, are the, uh, uh, are the troubled waters that uh, 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 Mrs. Clinton has leapt into. Mm. I guess one comment, what, maybe two comments. One is that um, when it comes to relations between India and Pakistan, the, the question is still ca Kashmir. So, I mean, the, there's always, Kashmir is always in the back. Whatever else right. is going on between Afghanistan and India and the U United States, between India and Pakistan, the question remains Kashmir. Yeah. Extremely, extremely, you know, in, you know, important sort of to, to foreground that and not background that. And without making light of the very real sufferings of the Kashmiris at the hands of both Indians and Pakistan, but particularly their sufferings at the hands of the Indian military, which has been uh, brutal, uh, yeah. in Kashmir, uh, there is a certain sense in which Kashmir becomes what Alfred Hitchcock calls the MacGuffin. You know, the thing doesn't really matter what it is, it becomes the issue of, that drives the plot. The plot is the con conflict between India and Pakistan, and uh, uh, Kashmir and all those dead people in Kashmir become the MacGuffin. Yeah. But let me just ask, you know, for the, for the viewers who, I mean, we live in this double world, double, double, you know, reality in which China has 
what used to be Red China back when I was trying to figure out who, <laughs> the, good, the, who the good yeah. guys and the bad the guys China. were. And now as a capitalist country, now as a state ca capitalist country with so socialist aspects to it, um, but we don't really call it communist anymore, even though it might be in some formal sense. Um, but and which which we rely on to provide us with our with our goods, or to right. at least at least as, you know as a as a kind of workshop as a kind of as a as a kind of as, you know assembly plant, and on the other hand we we rely on them to um, to lend us money, yep. to uh, fund our national debt, uh, a topic which we'll take up on uh, later, I'm sure. So what is what how is it to be explained? That they aren't they aren't our enemy anymore. They aren't our idi 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 they are not really our idi idi ideological um, adversary, but that we still um, raise the issue a kind of warlike warlike issues or warlike rhetoric against them. You want to you want to take a crack at that, Ron? Well, yeah, the uh, anti-China uh, propaganda continues. Uh, endless showing of the. Uh, uh, brave soul standing up to the tanks in Tiananmen Square mm -hmm. and so on. This has become a kind of uh, symbolic statement of something rather. But was that brave? Yeah, right. It was. And, uh, sure. Uh, yeah, the, the supposed violations of human rights uh, by uh, China. I understand China is starting to use some of the same rhetoric now against uh, the United States, pointing out the violations of uh, human rights uh, here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I think that's uh, smart of them uh, to do that because nobody's hands are clean, it seems to me, uh, in this respect. And Americans ought to be thinking more about uh, what we're doing, our violations in this respect, than uh, uh, spending so much time accusing uh, China. But all of these, of course, have their uh, propaganda uh, implications and uh, justifications. Certainly true. I, it seems to me one of the one of the uh, aspects of the post 9/11 world uh, is that all states use uh, the threat of terrorism as the U.S. does, yes. but against different groups. You know, we're against terrorism. Of course, U.S. against terrorism. But against terrorism. In China, terrorists turns out to turn out to be Uyghurs. Yes. Uh, in uh, Russia, terrorists turns out to be uh, Chechens. And, and in fact, both is true. I mean, yeah. there was a bomb blast apparently in Oslo this morning in the prime minister's office. Uh, and my first thought was: Was this done by jihadists or was it done by the CIA? Because Norway is not doing uh, it's not pulling its weight as American officials keep saying in the yeah. war in the Middle East. Yeah. So the the position of you know. Who are the bad guys? The question your, uh, David's profound friend asked when they were 12 seems to me right. Who are the good guys? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who's wearing the white hats and exactly. who are the black hats? Because we seem to have a terrible need to uh, know this and to personalize everything as a conflict between good guys, that's always us, and uh, our allies, and uh, the bad guys who are those who oppose us. And uh, of course they quickly became become suspected terrorists or suspected Taliban or suspected militants mm. or whatever when we uh, get around to killing them. You're watching News from Neptune, uh, presented each week at this time uh, by the good people at Urbana Public Television, Carl Estabrook, Ron Zoke, and David Green talking about the News of the Week and its coverage by the media. And uh, it's up to David to pull a, 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 a piece of paper out of the head. This is, yeah, this is a drastic uh, change in topic uh, from what we've just been talking about. And I hope this doesn't descend to the dull level of a school board meeting. But I want to talk a little <laughs> hey, about Champagne so. Unit for budgeting. Oh my. As a way of just providing a little context for what might be going on. It isn't that uh -huh. I've been, it isn't that I've been following it that closely. But I just, I've, I've realized in the last few days because of some things I've been, I've been looking at in relation to work and so forth, is that um, the uh, the st so-called stimulus package, the um, the which which is officially called the ARRA, the American Recovery and Re Reinvestment Act, is coming to an end. The funds are kind of petering out after a couple of years. There may still be a few remaining for this upcoming 2011-2012 uh, school year. But I was kind of asking asking the question and then trying to answer it. What would be the effect on local schools. Um, what I found out was at the federal level, and this is what uh, what 
uh, sort of got got my got my got my attention in the first place was that the the customary budget of the DOE, the Department of Education, the federal d d Department of edu Education, had been around fifty billion dollars during most of the last decade. Um, if one looks at the year 2010 or so, one sees that it spikes up to $150 billion. Really? And that may be because, I mean, that's obviously because of ARRA funds that were you know, devoted to it. And that $100 billion was probably spent over, has been certainly spent over two years, not over one year. Mm -hmm. But that has meant real money for, for every state. And uh, in, 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 in terms of, of, you know, not all of it went to supporting um, uh, public or all of it went to public schools, but not all of it went to secondary and, and ele elementary. Uh, there, was some, there was some Pell Grants involved in there, there was some high, other higher ed um, related stuff in there. But when it all comes out, what we found that this the state, this state, Illinois, had well over a billion, perhaps up to two billion dollars um, extra to spend on on schools over the last couple of years, and that Champaign County had uh, its share is about was about eighty million dollars, and that in local terms for all the districts, not just the Champaign. Uh, not just Champagne Unit Four, or, or, or but all of them, amounts, of course, to real money that kept teachers working and that kept school budgets fe feasible for the last cu couple of years. And this is coming to to an, to an end. Um, it wouldn't it wouldn't appear that the kind of cuts uh, that are being made in Champagne Unit Four are it, it, it may it wouldn't necessarily appear that they reflect quite the dra draconian cuts that one might um, um, expect from losing a good chunk chunk of change, chunk of, of money from the ARRA. But it's still, you know, it, it just as a contrast in terms of the kind of money we talk about in relation to our wars and everything else that we talk about at the federal level in terms of health care and billions and, trilli and trillions, you know, you know, of dollars, I, th I think it would be at least, I thought it would be it would be it would be um, um, at least informative at some level, and this isn't any secret around here. If, if you watch the school board meetings, which I, which I don't, but um, they that they have had to propose for the 2011-2012 year about two million dollars in in cuts combined with some rev which which would have been more. Um, they're looking for ways to get a little more money, but they're also looking for ways to cut back and. Of course, of course, as one would, uh, ex, you know, you know, expect, and I have a personal interest in this. I would anyway, even if, um, uh, even if my my wife and my child weren't both involved in different ways in, in arts and and mu music and so forth, which always tend to be the first things mm -hmm. to be to be cut back. Uh, we find, for instance, that Unit Four is proposing to save um, a hundred and fifty thousand dollars by something called Review Encore Options, Music and Drama Become One Class, Then One Less Teacher at Each Middle School. That's $150,000. Um, and there's a couple of other among these, among these related issues, which goes to show uh, they're charging students a little more to play, to play sports. They're cutting back um, se secretaries in the in the school office in this kind of calculated way, just to show you how this is being thought of. Um, uh, Centennial High School, according to this budget document, Centennial High School has 10.5 secretaries and 1,380 students. 1,380 divided by 195 equals 7.08 secretaries per student based on the Big 12 average, meaning the high schools, the, the major high schools in this area. Centennial has 3.42 extra secretaries. Rec recommend, recommend reducing by 1.5. <laughs> All for a savings of thirty-seven thousand five hundred dollars. Okay, so and I'm not saying this. You know, I'm not saying what I'm what I'm trying to show here is uh, in the midst of this. Again, as I've try, been trying to argue in various ways and different things, I've been writing uh, uh, in the midst of this of this eco economy, which con continues to uh, grow in real term, in, 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 except for the 
for the year or so for 2009 during the when the um, when the housing bubble burst and and GDP really really did fall back. Um, over a period of time, we've continued to become more more wealthy. But in the context that that has happened, we still find ourselves looking uh, to save a f at a local level to save a few thousand dollars here and there at the expense of one or two persons' mm -hmm. job mm -hmm. or larger classes. We're cutting back on school programs that are not sort of test driven, and um, that is certainly is is uh, a f you know affirmed by looking at the efforts of the of the local school districts to prepare for the upcoming year. And the question that screams itself here, it seems to me uh, at this point, David, is why aren't people upset about this? Why don't we have more people? I mean, a lot of, a lot of folks have kids in the local schools. A lot of folks have uh, friends or neighbors or family members who work for Unit 4 and so forth. Uh, yet, you know, you, you, you pointed out that you're talking about something that's rarely even mentioned. Yeah. Why don't we have why don't we have complaints about the lack of support state and federal uh, for schools for God's sake? Yeah, I, I don't have I mean I just I've I'm wondering in the larger scheme of things as we see this drastic bill I don't know what's going to happen with this debt bill in Congress mm -hmm. and the kind of cutbacks and then the kind of local cutbacks uh, that people and I I really I don't know what how to talk about it in terms of. A, a breaking point, a critical mass mm -hmm. of people who mm -hmm. are upset, um, an um, um, event that sets people off that mm -hmm. you know seems to be sometimes needed uh, to really to gra graphically show what the, the consequences of th these things are. Um, I, I don't know what it it will really take. Um, I just think that um, that people that I I I don't think. At a broad level, I, I, I guess I guess one thing I might say is that I think that our our, our local governments, and that would mean our our city councils and our our county council, are are really people that should be rep representing us. Should should be this representing the people of of this county and these cities mm -hmm. to Advocating. the state and federal governments. And I don't see them doing that. Mm -hmm. I don't see them saying that. I don't see these leaders um, saying this is this is what we I mean. We're we're at the ground level here. We're dealing with 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 these human problems, and we're we're suffering. And it's because of, say, the lack of a larger st st stimulus package to really get get the economy going. I mean, the reason, I mean, the background to this is that the stimulus package didn't really work. Right. So we're just falling back. So things are just going to get worse right. unless there's, and, and this is what economists like Paul Krugman and, and so forth have been, and, and m many others have been saying. But I just don't see these, these local, these, Local uh, governance, uh, uh, you know, ele elected elected officials, really um, um, attempting to to make it clear where the problem lies, and, and making it clear and to speak for us in relation to these state and national uh, le legislatures. Not representing is that the problem? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, what surprised me is you said nothing about uh, more and more layers of, of ever more highly paid administrators. Uh, making work for each other, writing reports for each other, and so on. And uh, at some point, uh, the, there may be uh, the kindling temperature uh, reached there when they appoint another uh, incredibly highly paid uh, administrator. But uh, those seem to fizzle out quickly, too, because they're viewed as uh, inevitable, I guess, and a lot of people think they can do nothing about it. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, when the president of the University of Illinois was paid over six hundred thousand um, hey, dollars, who does he think he is? A coach? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, uh, there are a lot of things uh, to uh, wonder about and uh, complain about uh, in that area. Uh, something else, another straw in the wind. Uh, three states, North Central states, are opting out of the No Child Left Behind program because they view the goal set there as uh, unrealistic, according to uh, this morning's news. And uh, there's much indignation about the people in uh, Atlanta who were changing students' answers on the 
uh, exams they were given, uh, testing, testing, testing. And uh, others are pointing out it's absolutely inevitable that when you attach so much significance and uh, uh, career advancement and firings and so on to uh, test scores, the incentive to uh, cheat uh, becomes uh, so strong that it's just what you have to expect. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, for my deal, I would like to uh, raise what I've called Obama fraud sub two, lowercase two, to tell us to, to distinguish it from Obama, Obama fraud sub one. Obama fraud sub one uh, is what made him president, it seems to me. It was the war. Uh, as uh, Obama pointed out in his book, Audacity of Hope, the greatest casualty, he thought, of the Vietnam War was the loss of trust in the government on the part of the American people. And not the reason for the loss of trust, but that uh, trust was lost, and he understood his presidency to be an attempt to reestablish that sort of trust. Well, there's another way of talking about that trust. Uh, it's essentially to tell lies to the American people so they would support what the government was doing. It was the fact that the, government, that the American people didn't support what the government was doing in Southeast Asia that uh, led to the uh, anti-war movement. And um, uh, Obama understood very well that he had to um, uh, co-opt any contemporary anti-war movement if he wanted to be president. He did it very well. Uh, he m made people believe that if they voted for John McCain, the war in the Middle East would be expanded, and if they voted for Barack Obama, we would have hope and change, and that change would involve, you know, these terrible wars that uh, uh, George Bush had got us into. Well, you know, I mean, we had that, the unedifying picture of the Obama people saying, aha, he never really said he was going to stop the war in Afghanistan. In fact, he said he was going to expand it, and he did. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, everyone knows that he was the peace candidate, the anti-war candidate in 2008, and that was a fraud. Uh, and the war has expanded. More people have died in Afghanistan under, Afga under uh, uh, Obama than under Bush. The war continues. And as we've argued here before, it really is just one war, uh, a war that has uh, a, a continuity uh, that Obama has fallen into perfectly happily. Um, in 2007, General Wesley Clark, who had run the war in Serbia, we talked about, uh, for the United States, we talked about that earlier, um, explained that the Pentagon was actually planning to take out eight countries in five years. Everybody said, oh, Wesley's around the bend. Now, he said in 2007, after the invasion of Afghanistan had begun, <coughs> uh, he said uh, the Pentagon plan is to uh, invade Iraq. Uh, he, that he was told after the invasion of Afghanistan in 2001, the plan was to invade Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Iran. Well, the Obama administration came into office uh, rattling its saber at Iran. Uh, the uh, Sudan uh, has uh, interestingly uh, transmogrified itself a bit, uh, but the other uh, uh, elements of that list uh, Syria, Libya, and so forth uh, do seem to have been in the news recently. So it seems to me that the Obama fraud about the war is pretty clear. What I want to suggest is that since the, the two most important things the federal government does is kill people and transfer money from the majority to the minority, from the poor to the rich, uh, that there is a second Obama fraud uh, regarding that transfer of money. Uh, we see now that um, as uh, uh, Glenn Greenwald put it, uh, for months the standard narrative among progressive commentators was that Republicans were outrageously exploiting the debt ceiling deadline to impose drastic, drastic entitlement cuts. Entitlement cuts mean Medicare, Medicaid, uh, Social Security. On a resisting and victimized Democratic President Obama. But it's now clear that the driving force behind these cuts is the President himself who is pushing for even larger spending cuts than the GOP was ready to accept. And all the backing and filling, all the arguments, all the White House meetings, all the uh, Boehner this and, and read that and the other that we've been hearing the other day, is masking Obama fraud too, which is an attack on Social Security, 
Medicare and Medicaid by President Obama, by this administration. And just as Wesley Clark talked about the plan for the war, so we knew the plan was in place when President Obama appointed the Deficit Reduction Commission and put Alan Simpson uh, and White House or Clinton uh, Chief of Staff Bowles in charge of it. Uh, Bowles happened to be head of Morgan Stanley at the time too, which might have given you a clue, but in any case, um, the whole point of the Deficit Reduction Commission, which came to be called the Cat Food Commission, uh, was to suggest that old people uh, who were getting Social Security were, um, uh, what, sucking on 3,000 teats, says, uh, right. says, says Alan Simpson, and they gotta be stopped. These things have to be broken up. Uh, well, that's obviously what the Obama administration was planning all along, just as what they were planning about the war is clear. And what we're seeing this week from this absolutely artificial conflict about the debt ceiling uh, is the culmination of Obama fraud sub two. Let me say, uh, perhaps relevant to that, uh something about this uh, editorial in the Nation uh, magazine called Debt Ceiling uh, Delusions. The Republicans have once again shown themselves to be a party, to paraphrase Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz, of the 1%, by the 1%, and for the 1%. Um, he doesn't say any, this doesn't say anything about the uh, Democrats, which I think are uh -huh. very much in the same boat. <laughs> but, uh, they mentioned in the 1950s, the corporate se sector uh, uh, accounted for an average 27.6% of all federal revenues. In, in 2010, it was 8.9%. And individual tax rates for the richest are now lower than in all but five of the past 79 years. So uh, this uh, notion that uh, we're being uh, taxed to death and uh, punishing the job creators is uh, utter nonsense. But we keep hearing it again and again, and apparently uh, some people actually believe that stuff. I guess, yeah, what I, one thing I'd sort of like to move towards clarifying, just for the sake of... of actually, do, you, do oh, me yeah. a favor. Let yeah. me, ju just because yeah. I, I, yeah. Well, that, uh, I think Ron's question is, sure. is, is absolutely right, and we should ask about it. And in a sense, I want to ask Ron the same question I asked you, David. Um, why don't we have, why is there no move to tax the rich out there? Why don't we, not, I mean, what you say is obviously true, but we don't hear, except in some peculiar specialized publications and television programs, yeah. anyone saying that, look, uh, money has been accumulating in the hands of the well to do an accelerating rate for 30 years. Yes. Why don't we tax it? Yeah. Why yeah. don't we hear, why don't we hear that? Is that, is that the, the uh, um, uh, propaganda job that this administration has done so well? That there, just as there's no anti-war movement of the type that we would have seen from earlier years, so there's no uh, 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 tax the rich movement of the yeah. type we actually have seen in this country in the past. Well, uh, the current line coming from Washington is that Obama is losing the liberals because they would like to uh, uh, get some more balance in the uh, tax code and uh, let the uh, tax rate on the rich revert to what it was before the Bush uh, tax cuts. And again, you're speculating about what uh, Obama's fundamental motivation No, 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 is. no, I'm asking about political movements okay. in this country. Why don't we have a political movement saying tax the rich? I, yeah, yeah. What, what, Ob what goes on in Obama's heart, heart of hearts is not, yeah. I think, the issue here. Yeah, okay, well, uh, you keep saying that, and yet you keep uh, re re returning to this point of what he's actually up to and what he really wants. And, I'm just saying uh, what the administration's policies are. Uh, okay, okay. Well, um, uh, yeah, uh, there are perhaps 70 members of Congress who would like to move in that direction, most of them uh, Democrats, apparently. But uh, they are blocked by the uh, current configuration of the uh, Congress. How do you come up uh, with that number? Uh, it's one that I've seen. The people that voted for this people's budget yeah, yeah, or whatever. Yeah, uh -huh. that's the idea. And uh, um, I uh, don't believe in any blaming any uh, large group uh, for that. Uh, I'm very skeptical about the notion that there is any group that's inherently more virtuous or uh, less so than any other uh, large group. Republicans, Tea Partners. And, and uh, 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 this gets me into trouble sometimes because I don't believe that there is any morally superior group uh, as such. It's part of my skepticism, I guess, about 
all political and religious doctrines, but but uh, but you do think they're morally superior actions. Oh so yes, some yes, things indeed. Be done yes, other indeed. Other thing. And uh, yeah. that, to me, is the granularity of uh, these kinds of ethical and political uh, debates, and uh, not large groups. So I don't really believe that uh, uh, Democrats, as such, are morally superior to Republicans, or the other way around, or um, there's a whole list of things. Uh, I don't believe that uh, women are morally superior to men, or children are morally superior to adults, or animals are morally superior to uh, people, or any of those things that some people seem to believe in uh, devoutly. I'm very skeptical about all that. But anyway. Uh, it puts me in mind of the wonderful remark of the British novelist Alice Thomas Ellis, who said, there's no reciprocity, no reciprocity. Men love women, women love children. <laughs> Children love hamsters. <laughs> right. David, you, I well, didn't, no, mean, didn't mean to I mean, turn I'm you trying, away. You know, I, I, yeah, I don't want to make this. I don't want to make this too obscure. I mean, the, the media is the elephant in the, the room here, yes, right. in terms of the forming the public Hamster opinions moves. that on, on which are based this lack of action and lack of outrage about what's going on, yeah. and what's been going on with the media for you know forever, but especially since the Re Reagan era is that. They kind of try try ang, try ang, ang, angulate the 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 um, you know debate as it moves rightward, mm -hmm. where we started out with lower, we went with the idea that we had to tax less and that government was too big, and and so um, the 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 the, the, the what, what always ends up happening is those po politicians who posture as compromisers end up end up affecting um, um, laws that move us farther to the right, uh, right to yeah. the point where, um, whereas Bush couldn't uh, enact cuts to so, 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 Social Security, it, it appears that Obama is is open to doing that. Yeah, yeah. So um, there, there just isn't any, there isn't any traction in, in a genuinely leftist media sure. to, to stop this from happening. Part of this is uh, Obama's apparent uh, belief in uh, the virtue of bipartisanship and compromise, and he keeps trying to appease uh, the right-wing Republicans, and they keep moving the goalposts and uh, giving, a, giving them an inch, and they take a mile. And uh, so he keeps uh, backing down and caving in, even if he had any contrary convictions to start with. So... Uh, but this guy on uh, this guy who was on Amy Goodman this morning, this uh, jenk yeah. guy who got fired the from his job at MSNBC, was basically saying Obama Obama's a Republican. I mean, I he goes, I know, I know Republicans. I, I used used to be <laughs> one. Now you know, I'm not one any any anymore. Yeah. But but he is one. He's yeah. a, a kind of a, 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 a sort of centrist Republican. Right, right. I think there's much to that. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, I must. I must. Uh, say that I'm surprised to hear Ron speculate on what uh, is in Obama's heart of hearts here, but we'll let that pass for I a moment. I was denying because, oh, uh, I trying to do that. Oh, got it. But, okay. uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I think that's really a kind of a dead end, uh, trying to uh, read people's minds and, and uh, tell us what their real, true underlying motives are. But, but I would like to go back to David's point about, uh, about the media. Um, it, what what's interesting to me these days is to see how many people, uh, good liberals, are saying that, look, um, uh, we've got a self-corrective system here. Uh, the editor of the News of the World was fired for committing second-degree Murdoch, and uh, you know now they, we, we, everything is cleaning up because this, these nasty media things are, uh, uh, are, are being corrected uh, by Parliament or, and it looks like in the U.S., even by the FBI. Man, we're going to make sure that uh, you know, this media problem is not a problem. Are you... Um, uh, uh, chuffed by this gentleman, as they might say in London. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to ask about one of the standard liberal uh, solutions or hopes or uh, nostrums in this respect. Uh, not only education, which I think yeah. uh, is, uh, as we understand education, is uh, not very hopeful, but uh, leadership, this mystique of leadership that I keep hearing about. The USA is the natural, rightful leader of the rest of the world. I wanted to ask, uh, does leadership consist in doing things in advance of or in defiance of public opinion? 
Well, take this maybe take this as a new topic, huh? Right? Yes. You want yes. to talk about the Fuhrer Princip and yeah, its yeah. its use in uh, modern American politics? That yeah, seems reasonable. Yeah, yeah. You got a take on that, David? Well, you know, I, I don't trust the the rhetoric of le leadership. I mean, I've never I've never trusted any of. That. I mean, I believe there are good leaders, but I've never trusted the rhetoric of of leadership as it's played out in all areas of life, including edu ed education, and b especially biz business, of course, for the last. 30, 40 years that we that there are these that we have these visionary people who uh, are are always uh, 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 you know ahead of the curve mm -hmm. and, and and so forth. So um, I I just think this is I mean, the, this whole topic of leadership just covers up what it is, or just denies that what the kind of change that we want are is change that's going to have to be generated from the bottom up mm -hmm. it's uh -huh. that's a change that's going to have to happen because the people force the leaders to do things that the leaders don't really want want to do you know like the famous roosevelt quote yeah. about make make yeah. me do it yeah. you know? i think i think leadership today i mean a lot of what we've said here this evening uh, uh, centers around the fact that what counts as leadership and i have to say our chief magistrate is uh, the best example we have at the moment for whatever reason whether it's his internal uh, abilities or the peculiar position he finds himself in that what leadership is is defining the debate uh, specifically defining the limits of allow debate. How are we talking about this? Well, we're talking about this in terms of how we're going to stop terrorism. We're talking about this in terms of how we're going to raise the debt ceiling. Because if we don't, you know, well, we're going to have to, we're talking about this in terms of how we're going to have to invade uh, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, because there's no way out. The economy demands it. But you have to be convinced of that, and the point David was making a moment ago, and somebody's job it, it is out there to be the chief convincer. And the, the leadership principle today is to be the convincer in chief, that is to convince enough of the, elect of the electorate uh, how to do it. And of course, this has been classically formed by, uh, in the statement of an uh, Illinois politician, that you can fool some of the people all the time, all of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time. Right. Nevertheless, that usually counts as sufficient. Yeah. And that's what they're doing. Related question, are the pollsters telling us anything useful in this respect? Of course. David, pollsters? <laughs> you've been quoting polls and the things you've been writing I, recently I, a good I, bit. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I just, um, the I, I look carefully at the polls that are, I have been looking at the polls that have been asking people what they think about this debt issue. And it's clear, even though I don't always think that that many people are being fooled as one might think, when it comes to understanding the absolutely silly and and you know deceptive nature of this whole debt debt debate people don't get it people the most people are having the at least about that particular issue are 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 the 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 vast the vast majority are having the wool pulled over their their eyes they just i mean it, it may have something to do with the way the the polling questions are being formed but they still have been have been convinced that this this debt issue is really what we ought to ought to be thinking about, but at least what in spite of that, what they do say is that they still want social social, social, right. social security and med, med, and med, 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 Medicare protected. So they're will they're willing to accept the terms of this argument, but they're they're not always willing to accept the 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 methods that the politicians are wanting to co come up with in order to to deal with this debt crisis. Yeah. I think there's a big difference between polls that ask about what people think, uh, as it were, in the abstract, and polls that ask people what they think related to names. Do you support what the president's doing? Do you support what the Republicans are doing? Something of that sort. I mean, a recent New York Times poll uh, found that 50, in the midst of this uh, folder all, this, this dog and pony show about the, uh, the debt and deficit, 53% of the respondents said that the biggest uh, the biggest problem facing the country and the administration today is jobs. Seven percent said the biggest problem facing the country and the administration de today is the debt and deficit. Now, you know, when, 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 that, when that goes down in Washington, what we find is absolutely no jobs bill at all except uh, what's bu built into the, as you said, inadequate stimulus uh, program. Uh, and we find this, this constant uh, uh, 
uh, screaming about the debt and deficit. Uh, yeah. That's leadership. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's an old question going back to the debates about public opinion in the 1920s. Uh, do leaders uh, reflect public opinion or do they lead it? Uh, do they come along behind or are they out really in front? And uh, it's a very difficult question to uh, answer with any assurance. How, but, how can you uh, say it's difficult, Ron, when, when, when what we've seen in the American 20th century is uh, uh, politicians whose business is always not just America by any means, has been to form those views. Exactly. You don't go out and find out what does the pu public yeah. want, and then I'll put myself at the head of yeah. that. What you do is go out and convince uh, you, uh, Woodrow Wilson runs to uh, runs for president on the grounds that he kept us out of war, and then works very hard indeed to get a pacifist country into war, yeah. which is what he meant to do all along, and I'm, I have no problem searching his heart of hearts here because he said so. Um, and. Uh, uh, you know, that, 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 yeah. that seems to me to be uh, uh, the, almost the paradigm case or the, 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 the initial case of 20th century America in sure. that regard carried sure. over to now. Yeah, well, uh, Edward Bernays, the uh, original presiding genius of political propaganda, uh, was very explicit about this in his book titled Propaganda, that uh, in a uh, large and multifarious uh, society, uh, this degree of, uh, some degree of propaganda is absolutely essential to get people moving in the more or less uh, same direction. And uh, uh, he thought uh, apparently that we would tear ourselves apart as a nation if uh, we didn't have that. The, uh, this brings us full circle to a point we raised at early in the hour um, about uh, uh, the liberal press. Um, the Guardian, uh, which we mentioned, has this vendetta against our uh, namesake Noam Chomsky uh, for this program, uh, published a piece last week by their liberal columnist, Nick Cohen, that one of the most remarkable, uh, uh, and insofar as you can figure out what he was saying, uh, accounts of this particular issue that I've seen in some time. Uh, the piece is entitled, Decline and Fall of the Puppet Masters. Uh, and it takes a while to figure out who the puppet masters are. Um, he begins by suggesting the puppet masters are Ratko Mladic, the man responsible for the Srebrenica massacre, and Rupert Murdoch. But uh, he ends by praising Murdoch to the extent of saying that the real puppet masters are those who uh, folks like Noam Chomsky say are forming the uh, national mind, that is the media. Uh, this is a liberal columnist for The Guardian saying that those people who think the media misled uh, are, re are um, uh, refuted by uh, recent events, uh, and he names specifically Noam Chomsky, Tarak Ali, the late Harold Pinter, and Arundhati Roy. And how are they refuted? They're refuted because they said that the uh, account we got from the governments of the U.S. and the U.K. of the Srebrenica massacre and of the Serbian wars um, was manipulated by the press. And now, says Nick Cohen, we see it wasn't manipulated by the press at all. And it was only when the U.N. finally got its act together and began killing Serbs uh, that the massacre stopped. Now, you have to read this to believe it. As I say, yeah. it's a remarkable piece of work for a man who's not a tyro. He's been doing this you know, liberal columnist stuff for years. But as an example of this, temp of this attempt to try to say, uh, to try to um, uh, uh, support uh, the uh, mind forming role of the media, it's not to be believed. It's yeah. just incredible. I mean, in both senses, it's not to be believed. Right. Right. Yeah, that uh, does sound. Uh, Pretty uh, deviant to me, but uh, <laughs> yep. uh, it's 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 sort of reminding me of the. Uh, 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 there's a column uh, on antiwar.com this morning by just uh, Justin Justin Raimondo about Todd Gitlin, yeah. and it seems like Todd Gitlin, you know, Nick Cohen and Todd Gitlin probably ought to ought to know know each other, or oh. maybe not. Do you notice how you never but, see them together? Yeah, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> But you know, I, I mean, this you know, it's it, we don't have the time. I don't have the time to go, to go in, into into this. But uh, Todd Gitlin is someone who fancied, who has always fancied himself a leader of the the le liberal left in this country. And of course, he he has not been for for quite some time. But he still criticizes the 
the uh, the supposed end of the an anti-war movement, and I, th I think that uh, it's worth it's worth reading the the criticism of him this morning on antiwar.com. Media Benjamin, Dia Benjamin also wrote a critique of that uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, number uh, uh, that another in a long series of stupid pieces by Todd Gitlin, and uh, they, yeah, they're worth looking at. I thought she was rather gentle with him myself because she is a good example of how the anti-war yeah. movement still does it quite very, very much yeah. exist. Uh, but I think the question becomes whether we have actual leaders like Noam Chomsky or Ralph Nader, or with, whether we have a cult of le leadership, which is sort of what we've had in this, I mean, insofar as, I mean, we do have leaders, we do have mover, movers and shakers and power brokers, and but they're not leaders of the people in any positive yeah, sense. Yeah. They're le the leaders of their social class. Yeah, what about these polls trying to find out who the most influential people are? Do you put any stock in them? Uh, <laughs> I think that usually shows who has the best publicist, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Could the be. public relations business. Yeah. You know. It's still yeah. very revealing to me that in supposedly democratic uh, nations of uh, Western Europe, the population was overwhelmingly against intervention in uh, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, and yet the governments did it anyway after the USA uh, bought them off. Doesn't an actor named Kutcher, Kutchner or Kutcher or something like that Kutcher, have, the, Ash, Kutcher, ha, have the, the most followers on, on, on Twitter? <laughs> hey, look, I'm on top of these things, guys. <laughs> <laughs> You've been watching news from Neptune on UPTV for the 29th week of 2011. Our program is named in honor of Noam Chomsky, uh, whom you can read about in The Guardian this week, uh, and you should. Uh, this has been the Obama Fraud Sub 2 edition. Uh, if our program interested you, you might want to look at these other programs heard regularly throughout each week on UPTV, The White House Chronicle, Sunday mornings at 7 a.m., repeated through the week, Democracy Now! every weekday at 7 a.m., The Big Pitch Picture with Tom Hartman every weekday at 8 a.m., Labor's Worldview with our friends Dave Johnson and Jim Iman, Sundays at 4 p.m., The David Pakman Show, Saturdays at 7 a.m., repeated through the week, and Essential Dissent. Sunday at 2 p.m. this week featuring Ward Churchill on indigenous rights and resistance. And um, what a populist dialogues, I think it's called, on Thursday afternoon at 1.30, uh, this week devoted to climate crises. And uh, that seems particularly timely. I'm Carl Estabrook. My discussions tonight on News from Neptune have been Ron Zoke and David Green. This and other editions of the program can be seen on the website newsfromneptune.com and on Facebook. And thanks to our director, Jason Liggett, uh, these are appearing now on the Facebook page. And I should uh, I urge you to look or at earlier what programs. You, what you mean to say is um, YouTube. Well, on YouTube, YouTube also. They, yeah. yes. Well, they are playing both, in fact. Okay. You can okay. find it. You can search YouTube for news from Neptune and find recent, um, uh, recent programs there. Uh, you can also see it on the Facebook page because I put it there. Uh, <laughs> my thanks to Jason Leggett. Uh, and inshallah, we will be back next week with a new edition of News from Neptune. In the meantime, confusion your enemies and a good night to you. <laughs>